Up next, Book Talk with Jenny Atia. In the next half hour, we'll meet with authors and literature lovers at a book fair in Los Angeles. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Jenny Atia. This is the fourth annual Los Angeles Times Festival of Books held here on the UCLA campus. It's an extravaganza of writers, readers, book buyers, and sellers. This year, over 100,000 people are expected to attend. Sandra Singh Lowe is known for her humorous commentary on National Public Radio, her performance pieces, and her writing. Her first book, called Depth Takes a Holiday, was followed by Aliens in America, and now her first novel. If you lived here, you'd be home by now. Sandra, you have a real talent for zeroing in on the nuances of life in Los Angeles, the subcultures. Where does this come from in you? I don't know where it comes from exactly, but I know what fascinates me is things that are small. So in a way, my writing isn't really, um, it doesn't take on the big politics of the world so much as looking at tinier and tinier things, which I find humor in there. I find that's the human condition when you're talking about um, nuances or subcultures. I'm talking about sub, 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 subcultures, and then the tiniest, most trivial thought that that person has, to me, that's interesting. If you were writing about anything at all, your humor, I believe, would still be there. Where, why are you so funny? What makes you funny? Well, it's interesting. I have tried to write stuff that's not humorous when I started out writing in classes, and, and just people don't like it as much. They don't respond to it. They don't remember it. So I've just learned for myself that humor is, is my voice. It's, you know, like how authors have their certain voice or whatever. Humor is the lens that if I can put it through that lens, that's how it comes out. And, and sometimes it's even better to take something tragic and weighty, etc., put it through that humorous lens, and then you'll probably have a richer piece. So, so that's just the way I write all kind, I write stuff that's not funny, and no one likes it. So, but but I, I value that, too. And I think the gift of being able to make someone laugh, and I treasure it so much in other people, is magic. And it's great. It's an absolute good. So, so I really strive for that. And, and I love it when I see it in other people's writing as well. I recognize a lot about myself in your work. Uh, I was born in Los Angeles. I went to high school here. The whole struggle yeah. of becoming a human being, of becoming proud of yourself, of fitting in. Right. Tell me about that for you. I think, uh, and actually that intertwines the question before this with this one, is that I think something that's rich about the humor place is that you're coming from an outsider status. So I found when I was going to Malibu Park Junior High School, where even the stars went, like Sean Penn went to our school. It's kind of like all Emilio Estevez, that, that you know, it's, it's the heightened junior high school experience because not only are the popular kids actually are movie stars, you know, <laughs> just kind of like, and, and so I was one of the nerdy kids, but I was kind of, ha we were in our n happy nerd bubble. We would start all kinds of clubs and leap around in Renaissance costumes and whatever, and, and we became probably better people because of that, I think. So, but, but to be uh, in that outsider status of not the blonde, perfectly complexioned prom queen, there's a kind of survivor's gallows humor that you cultivate to find with your other fringe people that I think is a rich and wonderful place. So I, my continuing struggle as a humor writer is I used to write write a, a, a column in Buzz about my own life, is to keep finding that outsider status. So that even, even if, as a writer, well, I'm published, so that makes me luckier than other writers to keep finding why I'm the outsider, because that's where humor comes from. When I was in high school here in Los Angeles, I uh, was Which very, high school? I went to Westlake. Oh, gosh, yeah. I came from living in abroad, and I came back to Los Angeles, and I was, as I am today, very pale. And this was not the time to be pale. I also noticed that all the girls, it was an all-girls school at the time, had fingernails that were multicolored with a little star stuck in the, uh, the fingernail polish. And I didn't have fingernails like that. Oh, and yeah. believe me, I suffered. Oh, yeah. Have you suffered like that? Let's see, I believe in our school it was the candies or the corkies sandals. We had the chemin de fer cross, uh, across the front jeans, the bell-bottom jeans. Oh my God, no, no, absolutely. That kind of ostracization that happens when you're in junior high and high school. And the high school, unfortunately, totally continues in adulthood and becomes even bigger. One of the joys and horrors about living in LA and why I like writing from here is again, 
talk about subcultures in totally superficial topics. For instance, something like InStyle magazine, which I think is kind of like the, the end of our culture where it's kind of like, uh, you know, Nicole Kidman makes dip. And, you know, it's like, and Nicole Kidman, who looked beautiful without makeup, came a little late to the end. It's like, why does a woman have to look beautiful without makeup? Like, I need makeup. I have combination skin. It's like, it's like a genetic lottery of weeding out, like, like, and, and so that's one thing that bothers me currently. It's kind of like, Nicole Kidman, without makeup, just put on some makeup. You're a star. It's okay. So, so that, like, I want to be the one that makes dip. I don't want Nicole Kidman also to be making the dip. Now if she's in the kitchen making a better dip than me, where's her room to be me? <laughs> so, so I think all the things that you're like with the West Lake and the girls and the stars, it's like it continues to our culture like even to today. And I find that a rich area, even if, uh, again, from, from, it sometimes seems a superficial thing to dwell on this kind of stuff. And I just take pleasure at, at analyzing these tiny superficial things because I think there's a lot of a life is taken up with that and somebody has to stand up for the stupid things we obsess over. In your most recent book, If You Lived Here, You'd Be Home By Now, you chronicle the sufferings of a young couple trying to make it, trying to find a place for themselves, elbowing in any way to get to somewhere, and they don't. Right. What was that about for you, writing that? Well, I think um, the title, If You Lived Here, You'd Be Home By Now, is um, it's actually a sign that hangs on condos in LA. I've heard they have them in Boston and Chicago. And that's a sense that is a larger sense of like, it's the grass is greener is basically what it comes down to of living in the American culture of, and always yearning for something beyond. Partly I feel now is something that's created by advertising. For instance, whenever I see those gap ads with the swing dancers, I always get depressed because I go, they have more fun in 60 seconds than I would ever have in my whole life to wear the gap pants and swing dancing. I don't know where people in commercials are having so much fun, but they seem to be having more fun than me and I always want to get there. I go to gap, I buy the pants, they don't fit me, I'm a reverse fit. So it's kind of like, so, but I think that's, that's a commonality with our culture, especially in L.A., where everybody who lives in L.A. always has come from somewhere else. They don't ever consider themselves natives. Even if they've lived here 20 years, they always think that L.A. is better for someone else than it is for them. So it's kind of a, a place of, of always yearning for something beyond so that your sense of home is not where you are. It's, it's this fictionalized home. It's a picket fence farmhouse in Connecticut with Martha Stewart whatever and the bookstore and the cappuccino nearby. We all have this fictional idea of home that's often not where we live. What do you see as the dividing line between success and failure here in Los Angeles? How does one make it? I think it's mental. I think it's totally a mental thing. And I, I think of LA as that you can never, I at one time wanted to write a column called The B List. It's not the A-list of people perpetually on the B-list, and that's like Bronwyn and Paul, the protagonist in my novel. It's that you're always on the outside looking in. You know, if, even if you get invited to the party, there's a VIP room that you can't get in. You get into the VIP room, it's at the wrong hour. You get in at the right hour, Robert Redford is there, he doesn't speak with you. So that even people who are celebrities are continually looking beyond, like, I was on People Magazine, but I didn't get the cover, but my competitor got a two-page spread, I only got one. I mean, it's, it's an endless, even people in the center don't be, are always yearning for something beyond. So I think it's totally in the head. You have become quite a success. How does that affect your creative abilities? That's really interesting. First of all, I love hearing that I'm a success because I'll just carry that for the next five years of self-loathing. Um, I think, uh, well, there are two aspects of it. One is a sense of celebrity, like, and, and in my public radio field, it takes very, not very little to be, you can be a mini celebrity in tiny circles even though in the large celebrity thing, nobody knows you, but in a tiny public radio thing, you can be a mini celebrity. I mean, I think the other thing, again, with success is, again, trying to hold on to that outsider status. Recently, I've been going off on a tear because next month is Pacific Asian American Heritage Month, to which I have not been invited, as I like to say. So my whole ethnicity is really a problem, and I've seen anthologies of Asian American women writers who live in California that I'm not in, not that I, not that I really care. And that's, that's why I can joke about it, because I don't, because I, you know, it's kind of like, I've been in collected in so many bigger places than some of these tinier things. And so I'm raving about this to my sister. And yeah, and they invited that person and like, not me. And I mean, I write Asian stuff, maybe not all the time. And she goes, what's interesting about you is that 
you are a success. You are in the mainstream. You're now the people, a person that other people might side against, and yet you're still turning this into an underdog thing. But she said, she said, but I like that. You know, it's a warm thing. But I realized that's just my modus operandi all the time. But I want to do it in a funny, wherever I find potential for humor, I'm going to, because humor is what I do first. And so I don't want to, I only want to be whiny if it's funny, but I feel I can make whiny funny, so I'm going to go there. But, but that, that's the kind of thing with the success, you have to keep going to that place, no matter how ridiculous, to make sure you're always the underdog. And so that's kind of working at it. Well, I very much appreciate you talking with me. My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure.